Fan, Monday morning racer here, and this is another quarantine special because we're all under quarantine. But you can catch all this great action on Drag Racing TV, empowered by Strutmasters.com. We caught up with Scotty and Susan Polachek. They're out there in Oregon, guys. How are you handling the coronavirus matters we're going through, being under lockdown? How are you making it? You know, we're just trying to get through it like everybody else. And our state is one of the states that's on a total lockdown other than essential business. So it's definitely not what everybody wants to do, but what everybody's having to do, that's for sure. I'm going crazy. I'm just going to say it. I'm used to going to the gym every day, and I'm very, very routine and very scheduled person, and I do everything in a certain way, and I'm not being able to do any of that. So. I'm going a little crazy. I've been going outside a lot because we're allowed to go outside to exercise or go to the grocery store. So I go to the grocery store every day and I go run or hike every day, even though that does get me out a little. It's not quite the same, but it'll be all right. It's for the, the, the greater good. We've got one holding it together and the other one's about to lose it. I imagine things are very interesting in the Polytech house then. So out he, there he's an essential employee. So he still gets to go to work. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to work every day, but it's not like normal, that's for sure. You know, everybody's really worried about the virus. Uh, business is way down. You know, a lot of, a lot of people aren't leaving their house at all. Um, definitely, there isn't anything normal going on, that's for sure. Off camera, you all mentioned that you don't mind the moniker of hobby racer. So clue us in, what is the at home work business when you're away from the track so when when we're at home we have uh quality tire which is a business we've had for 29 years and you know i spend the vast majority of my time you know working and grooming that and uh taking care of there's 14 of us there so there's there's always a lot going on it's always really busy you know so if we're not at a racetrack somewhere then we're at home and i'm at the tire shop I work from home. I work from home. I do court transcription for a bunch of counties in Oregon. So I can do that on the road in rental cars and race trailers on airplanes. So I'm still, so I can work at home. So that's okay. Man, can't get away. <laughs> no, I can't. That's why I said I'm going crazy. <laughs> also, you know, guys, just, well, the whole mindset of knowing that, yeah. you know, you live in America, but they're telling you, you can't do this. You can't do that. Um, you know, they don't want you going anywhere. It's it's just a really strange time for everybody because I don't think anybody's ever, you know, mm -hmm. lived through something like this where you know so much of the lockdown like it is now. It's definitely a different deal. I mean, as Americans, we obviously pride ourselves on our civil liberties and the ability to get up and go and travel. And and if I want to go drag racing, I can go do that. If I want to skateboard, I can do that. Whatever it might be. But certainly we're having to deal with the challenges that for public safety, we've got to be self-aware and under lockdown and quarantine. And well, even though we might go a little stir crazy, make sure no one else gets this coronavirus. Now, with all that's going on in business home and, and with the coronavirus, we're not able to race. So give me your take on the now condensed rescheduled NHRA 2020 schedule. What are your thoughts and impressions on it? You know, I think it's going to be, it's going to be really tough. There's so much tradition, you know, certain weekends that certain races, you know, that everybody always knows, Hey, this is the weekend that we go to Charlotte or, you know, wherever it is. And a lot of that's changing now. Another thing that's some of them are going to be two day races, you know, we're definitely not used to that. Two qualifying runs on Saturday and going to eliminations on Sunday. That's going to make things really stressful, really tough. For all the racers, you know, you normally have four runs to get the qualifying in. It's going to be a whole different deal for everybody. Um, a lot to get used to, you know, as far as the fans, you know, NHRA, the racers, everybody. I mean, it's going to be a lot out of the norm, but, uh, you know, everybody's going to have to find a way to make it work, that's for sure. Yeah, four back-to-back -back races is going to be brutal for a West Coaster. 
at, on airplanes a lot because we don't get the luxury, I call it a luxury, of just staying on the, on the hauler in between races or something. We fly all the way back home, back and forth after every race. So four back-to-back -back races and then what, like a week or maybe two off and then three back-to-back. -back. It's going to be pretty brutal for his, for his work, especially for him being gone that much. I mean, it, we'll, we'll figure it out. It'll be all right. But it's, it's going to be brutal on a lot of us. I think we're all going to be a little, a little edgy. Yeah. There's, there's so, high. so when we get back to the track, what do you think will be a difference for you all as competitors and for fans? Do you think fan experiences will be different? Do you think interaction with competitors will be different? Do you think that through the rest of the year we're going to have to take any other precautions possibly to make sure, you know, this virus or any other thing that may come along doesn't spread through the entire NHRA pits? I think everything's going to be different. Yeah. And I think, you know, as time goes on, more and more things are going to change. You know, we're, we're at the very beginning of this right now. And the more they learn, you know, in the medical field, the more, you know, suggestions they're going to have. And it's going to be tough at the races because, you know, we're so fan friendly and involved with the fans, you know, having them at the pit, you know, putting little kids on the motorcycles, doing autograph sessions, um, you know, it's just going to be a whole different deal. You know, there, there's going to be a lot of, you know, parents that don't want the kids, mm -hmm. you know, going up to anybody and, you know, get close to them, you know, regular fans, who knows, you know, what they're going to want to do. I think, I think the fan camp will probably be down just out of just, you know, pe just being scared for now. I think a lot of people are really scared. A lot of people aren't. I just, I think by the time it's all over, we'll probably all be really careful for a while and maybe a year or two down the road, we'll start to get a little complacent. I think it's like anything, you know, right, right out of the gate, you're going to be super hyper vigilant. And then, I mean, it's just like anything. And then as time wears on, you know, you get a little bit more laxed on certain things, but I think for this year it's pro I think fan count will be down, especially with a lot of the races being moved. People plan to come to the races year in advance. You know, we know people that plan every year way in advance and they take time off work. And now a lot of people going back to work may not have any able, able to take time off, whether or not they have it coming. I think there's going to be everything's just going to be so different and it's all very unknown right now what it's going to look like. It's scary, you know, with the way the economy is going to be, you know, how many fans are going to be able to come to the races, you know, and whether, you know, NHRA should maybe adjust you know, ticket prices or something uh, you know, to incentivize the fans, you know, to come out because, you know, the economy that we did have a couple months ago, it's going to be a while before that comes back. So it's going to be yeah. interesting to see, you know, how the, how the fans do attendance wise. It's scary. Well, in the pro stock motorcycle ranks, you'll definitely do have a great fan experience, even though some people might not have, you know, went on down the path from the nitro pits quite as of yet. Look, clue us in. What are some things right now in modern day NHRA that you all in the pro stock motorcycle ranks are in fact doing to make that fan experience that much more? Give fans a little bit more pain for their buck that they spent on that ticket. This is a pit pass. I'll let Susan take that one because that's right up her alley that uh, she's in charge of most of that. So she'll be the perfect yeah. one to explain it. So we've worked really hard as a class as a whole. I think that the really cool thing about our class, Sports Talk Motorcycle, is we're all competitors. Everybody obviously wants to beat everybody when they're on the line against each other. But we all work really, really, really good together as a whole. We'll have, you know, class meetings and and figure out what we want to do to try to, you know, make our class better. We have um, a social media girl that runs our uh, PSM uh, Pro Stock Motorcycle page, um, Natalie. She's amazing. She's at every race and she takes care of the whole page and she's always trying to come up with more ideas and bounce stuff off each other, the whole class does. So we've implemented all sorts of stuff for the social media side because that's kind of our niche. Uh, we're not Nitro, we know that, and but we have our own following and the 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 social media aspect right now, we're doing great. There's a lot of stuff going on, trying to keep the page busy right now. Uh, a lot of Facebook Live and, and, and Instagram Live and a lot of that kind of stuff. At the track itself, we put together Friday autograph sessions 
but I'm not quite sure where that's going to go. We're going to have to have a meeting and see if anybody's even going to want to do those anymore. And I'll have usually three quarters, sometimes almost every entrant. So we might have 22 entries and I might have 20 people at the autograph session. So they're all really into it. And the fans love it. We started that about two, two and a half years yeah. ago. And now we're doing a pro stock motorcycle school, kind of like the nitro school. I think we just, the middle of last year started swapping between pro stock car and then us. So we do it every other race now. I'm not sure if we're going to be doing that. Um, we try to do parades, which is really awesome about, we don't, our, 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 we don't take up much space, so it's really easy for 20 motorcycles to come down the path in front of the fans, in front of the grandstands, and everybody waves, and the fans love that. NHRA loves it, and they work really hard with us to make that doable at as many tracks that it's, you know, logistically possible. Um, we, we'll do rollouts where we roll the motorcycles out into, outside of our pits from behind the ropes. Um, Charlotte's a great place that we do that and let the kids sit on the motorcycles and, you know, people take pictures and get autographs. We've been really, our class is so good about that and, and being, you know, really accessible to the fans. I don't know now with the coronavirus, what we're going to look like when we get back in June. Um, but we've worked really hard and it's work, it's working really great. Our fan base is growing like crazy. I wish Natalie was here to give you the numbers for our social media site. It's grown like crazy. So we're, we've gained a lot of new fans from a lot of the stuff we're doing at the track and off the track. That's great to hear. I know that I definitely count the Pro Stock Motorcycle Gang very accessible. My first ever interview last year at the Southern Nationals was Andy Rawlings. She gave me my first ever interview. Very sweet gal. Love Andy. So definitely she represented well the Pro Stock Motorcycle Gang. Look, let me do some dreaming here with you, though, Susan. Okay. You've got the great fan experience things going on now, but where do you want it to get to? What would you like it to become out there in this? You know, I think the possibilities are endless. Um, I mean, we have some logistical problems at certain tracks about doing certain things. I think the motorcycle school, we've really grown so much. I, I, don't, I don't really know exactly, like I could go crazy with ideas. Participation, I mean, our class is great, but they still are there to do a job. You know, they're, they're there to, you know, to win a race. And so we try to fit it in wherever we can far enough away from, you know, Q1 or Q2 or Q3 or Q4 or Q1 or whatever. Um, we're trying to evolve and, and change. And we, you know, we've, we have meetings as a class to try to get new ideas flowing. I don't know that I have any great ideas right now. We didn't get to have our team meeting, our class meeting in Gainesville and kick some new stuff around for this year. But I mean, I'm hoping, I'm hoping we can still do some, some, some great new stuff. I just don't know what yet. Our, that doesn't really answer your question. Our class always gets together with, you know, all the riders, all the team members, the team owners, and everybody. And we'll just do a little round table and everybody throws out ideas, you know, what they want to do, they want to try this, they want to try that, change this, change that. And, you know, we'll come up with some bullet points from that. And then we'll have meetings with NHRA, you know, with Glenn Cromwell and this whole group and tell them, you know, what we're wanting to do. And, and they've been really good about letting us try different things. Um, and they tell us what they like, what they don't like. And, you know, when we land on something that sounds like it's going to work, you know, they get right behind it just like we do. And, you know, so we're, we're real flexible about trying new things, you know, and somebody come up, up with an idea and we'll try to put it in motion. Or the yeah. Other. Well, what, you're, what you all are doing is great. I know the parades are very cool. I know fans still talk about something that's not in the NHRA anymore. And, you know, the pro talk used to parade down the track as like pre-race ceremonies at the national events. I mean, they need, to, they need to bring that kind of stuff back. So I'm glad y'all are doing your part in your class. So twofold question, uh, or to each of you, give your own experience rather. Scott, Susan, what has been so far over your career the best fan interaction you've ever had? What warms your heart? What just what you know, made you leave the track that day and go like, wow, I'm glad. I can be this person in this other individual's life and make their day. I wonder if you're thinking who I'm thinking. Are you thinking who I'm thinking? So I'm, I'm thinking a couple of different things. Um, one, one of the things that really comes to mind is we've, we've made some friends that are little buddies of ours 
They're twin boys. Ryan and Xander. That's exactly what I was going to say. And Hi, Ryan and Xander. <laughs> I think they're six or seven now. Oh, uh, yeah. And we first met them at the racetrack. Their parents bring them to a lot of races every year. A lot. They're and, awesome. And they, they give them the choice of what they want to do. Do they want to go do baseball, whatever? And they, the boys always want to go to the drag races. And so they're at four or five, six races every year. More than that, I think. But it, yeah, it, it might lot. be. And so I think they were a year and a half, maybe two years old when we first met them. They were in a wagon. Yeah. They were being pulled in a wagon. And Little they're just adorable. Twin boys with the same mohawk haircut. Not anymore. They grew it out right. this year. <laughs> but they changed the color, you know, all the time. And so we have pictures of us with these boys every year um, for the last five years at least. Yeah. And it's just the whole family just loves the sport of drag racing, you know. It, it, their passion to come to the races. So that's one of the things that really sticks out to me is seeing mine. them grow up. That was mine too. And they, they get little jerseys. I think Angie's made them a jersey. Angel has Terry McMillan. They're really tied in with Terry McMillan. So they always have their little jerseys. And I remember his mom telling me this last year for school picture day, they, they get to pick out what they wanted. They wanted to wear one of their little team shirts <laughs> for their school pictures, which was really cool. See, and it, that's what's so awesome is it's, and it's these parents, you know, they started bringing them when they were really little. And I think more parents need to get their kids out to the racetrack. The little ones, when NHRA started doing free under 12, I thought that was brilliant because you should bring your kids out there. It's great. It's good for them to be exposed to this. This is cool stuff. This gearhead stuff is awesome. And it's, it keeps people out of, for the most part, out of trouble than some other things wouldn't necessarily do. It's very family oriented, which I think is, is the crux of the whole thing, in my opinion. I've got another one too. So several years ago, we met some, some people in Charlotte, uh, Curtis and Emily, and we, we were staying at the hotel and we met them at the hotel and just by coincidence and amazingly enough, a few years down the road now, they're some of our best they're friends. They're some of our best friends. And yep. they, we call them the Virginia Mafia. They have this whole <laughs> crew. They'll bring 15, 16 people to a race. Vegas, last friends. year, a whole bunch of their friends. And they're like, they're, they're just the greatest people. On, so yeah. now them and all their friends are like family to us. You know, we talk to them all the time. And, you know, we're always planning, okay, which races are you coming to? And, and they're from Richmond. So they're super, I, I tech, when I got the new schedule this week, he was the second person I texted. I texted him first, and then I texted our girls in the motorcycle class and, and uh, Curtis, and he was pretty disappointed because he just barely got Richmond back, what, two years ago? Yeah. So no Richmond this year, so that sucks for them. But they come to Bristol and Charlotte and Vegas, so we'll still see him. But it's pretty cool because we were just at the bar at the NBC Suites in, in Concord, and where I think there's been a lot of friendships probably made there. <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of what you, you kind of do, you know. You get out of the track late, you get back to the hotel, you just want to go get some food and a beer and relax and get to bed and do it all over the next day. So. And he was there because uh, he's friends with Matt Hagen. Yeah. So, you know, he was well-versed in the funny car class, but he didn't really know anything about the motorcycle class. So now, you know, he is a pro stock motorcycle know mega fan yeah. him and all of his his friends you know and, um it's just really neat you know the things that you know happen you know just by happenstance you know when you're out there on the road doing stuff and, and meeting fans like that you know yeah. and, you know so it, to us it's like they're just like family now yeah. look speaking of jerseys as you mentioned i saw chip lofton there at gainesville and i was like man that's a, that's a good looking jersey you got on there and it was this purple Jersey, just like what you are wearing now for the strutmasters.com banner. And I got to ask, I love how the bike looked last year, blue. Now you've made the switch to purple. So why the change? I'm going to tell it. Yeah. For nine years, I've been trying to have a purple motorcycle. Nine years, never been able to get purple. And um, so this year, uh, we could have purple. So I asked Matt, you want to paint that bike purple? And this year he said yes. Last year he said no, because we didn't know if we were racing the whole year, which I understood because he would rent it if we weren't renting it. And he's like, I don't know that I could rent a purple motorcycle. I'm like, okay. 
So this year, thanks to Chip Lofton, because he's amazing, and he wanted to sponsor us for the whole year. We knew we were riding the whole year. And I said, hey, Matt, we're riding for the whole year. Can I have my purple bike now? And he said, yep. And he painted it, and he matched it perfect to the leathers. And Jason from Pro Things matched our shirts perfect. And so big de debut in Gainesville didn't happen. But surprise, we're purple. <laughs> so yeah, we love it. Purple's a great color. I, I love purple, you know. It's my favorite color, in case you were wondering. Yeah. And the blue was great. You know, the blue was a really cool color last year, and, yep. and a lot of people really liked that. But I think uh, changing the purple, you know, just something new and different, um, it, you know, really stands out. I don't think you're going to see very many cars or motorcycles okay. that color out there. So I think it's just fun and different. And the motorcycle looks awesome. Matt's got oh, a, yeah. a great paint paint guy. I wish I knew his name so I could throw, throw his name out and give him props. But he did a fantastic job. He just got a little leather swatch from Vanson Leathers, who's our, our leather supplier who makes amazing leathers. Shout out to Matt at Vanson. Um, just a little purple swatch of the, the foil leather and had his painter match it, and it's perfect. So, yeah, we're really happy. Well, definitely looking forward to seeing the strutmasters.com purple. Pro stock motorcycle bike going down 1320 and turning on wind lights this year in 2021. Whenever we get back to the track, look, Chip Lofton definitely a great oh, guy, man. helps out a lot of teams, helping out you, the Polacheks, with the Pro Stock Motorcycle Program. Tell me, strutmasters.com, the expansion, the suspension experts, and also whoever else your partners are. Talk to me about them and how pivotal they are for you to be able to go out there and run. Well, I think we have a little bit of a unique story, you know, with Strutmasters. Um, you know, ob obviously, you know, Chip stepped in at the end of last year and, you know, made it to where we could stay out there the rest of the year and put a program together this year that we would be, you know, out there all year with Strutmasters.com on the motorcycle, which is phenomenal. But the neat thing about him sponsoring us is I actually use the suspension stuff that he builds at my shop. We've, we've done two of them already uh, this year where somebody comes in, you know, with a, a vehicle that has um, the air suspension stuff. And when it goes bad, that stuff's really, really expensive to fix. So we gave him the option, Hey, you know, instead of doing that, we could put strut master stuff in there, save you a ton of money. And you won't have any trouble again, you know, with the air stuff, you're always at risk of that going bad. It, it's neat that, you know, somebody that is our sponsor, you know, is actually somebody that we buy a product from yeah. and actually use it. So it's, it's great for us to promote it because we can actually talk about it and relate to it right. and say, you know, Hey, we, we just did this last week, you know, put this system in and the customer was thrilled and they saved a ton of money and, it, uh, it's just a really cool program to be able to use, you know, what your sponsor yeah. you know, puts out like that. So. so when he talks about it, it's it's actual. He's not just saying what he's supposed to say because he's a sponsor. He actually really knows the product, and it's awesome. I, I got to go down and watch them the last time they got one in and see it all come out of the box, and it's really cool stuff. That's Chip is a very smart man, very smart man to be able to figure this out. And the way he did it, if anybody's read the story, is awesome. He's great. We love him. Stellar. Well, guys, look, I've been dying to ask, how did y'all meet and now doing this drag racing thing? How did it all come together? Us two? Yes. Or us and Chip. <laughs> you two. Um, we were boyfriend and girlfriend in eighth grade. We went to the same high school and grade school and junior high school. Junior high. Um, so, yeah, we were boyfriend and girlfriend in eighth grade. And it's just a lovely story that he loves when I tell. He, his mom moved across town, so he rode his bicycle to school every day so we could stay in the same school. And then he became, because she went to a different school district, moved to a different school district. And then he became best friends with his best next door neighbor or something. And so a couple months later, he decided he wanted to go to school with his best friend. So he left me for his best friend. Who coincidentally, they owned the tire shop together. So anyway, we broke up in eighth grade and we got back together about Six, 17, 16 years ago? 16. 16. He's better with numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. that's, that's pretty close to how it went down. But it, but it all worked out in the end, though. 
Definitely, definitely. That's good to hear that from uh, budding romance and breakup, it's come back together full circle and y'all are doing this drag racing thing, tag teaming it. How did you two get involved in drag racing? Scott, I know a little bit about your background. You did start with a car. What was that car and how did you transition to the bikes? And then Susan, were you just along for the ride with, you know, m with uh, Scotty being involved? Or, you know, were you, were you in drag racing before? No, I wasn't at all. I actually was a bodybuilder and competing in bodybuilding competitions. And so it's like nowhere near the racetrack at all. My first racing experience, um, he flew me down to Pomona for the uh, finals in, what was that, 2004, because um, we were dating. And so my first time at, at, at a drag strip was on a Sunday for race day, and I wore white. So that will tell you how much I knew about draggers. Never again have I worn white. Um, yeah, so that I knew nothing about it, but it was kind of one of those things that he was a, what were you, 35 then? Something like that, 34, 35 year old bachelor. Um, and I don't think he'd found a woman that could actually put up with the drag racing. Cause I think most women, when they roll into it, not having come from it, want to just knock it out. And so, I think I'm the only one that can deal with it. And so here I still am, or he'll blow me out like he blew everybody else out. <laughs> That's the way I tell that story too. <laughs> but I love it. Go ahead. I think for me, I, I was just a hot rod kid. You know, my buddies and I all had, you know, hot rod cars. And so mine, mine was a 73 Nova. And that was all I did, you know, when I was 15, 16 years old was you know, work on the car and minute I got my driver's license, we started going to the racetrack with all of our buddies. And, um, that was what we did, you know, work on the car all the time, go out, see if you can make it faster, come back, try something else. Um, about a year after that, I got my first motorcycle. It was a, a big one. A Yamaha FJ1200 street bike. At 17. And uh, <laughs> first thing I did with that was take it out to the racetrack. And I found out right away that it was faster than my car and it was cheaper than my car and it was a lot less work. So I could go faster, you know, way easier, way cheaper. And so I've been on a, a motorcycle ever since then. But, you know, I've never, never not had a motorcycle, never, you know, not been drag racing. Um, and I would just, you know, progress up through, you know, the ranks of going faster and faster all the time with, you know, different motorcycles and um, different events. First, it was all local stuff, you know, and then I started traveling the West Coast. Then, um, you know, every little bit, you know, we'd get something that was faster and we'd go travel farther and farther. And, um, you know, just till, till I got to where we are now, which, you know, I always wanted to ride. And so I've been really, really fortunate to, you know, basically live my dream of, you know, competing in HRA, you know, doing the pro stock motorcycle thing. Um, and I really, really got to give kudos to this one, you know, like she said, you know, she didn't know anything about drag racing, you know, never been to them, any of that kind of stuff. And she took right to it. Um, you know, just loved, you know, everything about it. Um, you know, she's just as passionate, if not more than I am you know, about it now. I mean, a prime example is, you know, what she does with the pro stock motorcycle class, you know, she, um, organizes a lot of stuff, you know, like the autograph sessions, um, the social media stuff, you know, she goes around and collects the money from everybody that we pitch in for that. You know, she works really close with NHRA and all the things that they want to do. I mean, I couldn't ask for a better partner, you know, doing what we're doing. And he's not sucking up. He's just being nice. You know, <laughs> because there's so many, you know, couples out there that, you know, either the wife doesn't want to be involved, you know, or doesn't like it or you know goes and just you know is there but you know she loves it like I do and she's just really involved and passionate about it. So it's neat that we can have you know that together as well. Well Scotty look I'm glad that your first experience with a motorcycle propelled you to where you are today. My first experience with a motorcycle propelled me into the ditch off <laughs> Kawasaki Ninja 300. So 
you know, you know, talking about writing skill and writing ability, I was going through some old footage with you. It seemed like basically you were auditioning for Star Racing is what I happened upon. And they talked about your riding style that one you picked up from a school of there somehow how to ride and over that time the style had changed and just by like transferring your body weight you were able to pick up a better 60 foot time so talk to me about your body body english as it were on a bike and how that does impact the run so on, on the motorcycle you know the rider on top of the motorcycle is a huge part of you know the overall package um, you know, part of his weight, part of it is aerodynamics. Um, and what you're talking about is basically at the launch and, you know, a, a pro stock motorcycle run is pretty much, you know, make or break in the first 60 feet. And if you can get the bike to 60 foot good, you're going to have a you know, much better run. And so part of that is getting the momentum going forward, you know, so, you know, you're in kind of a position like this. When you let that clutch fly, the idea is we call it ramming. So your whole upper body you want to slam down onto the tank, basically. And the reason you do that is that gets all of your body weight moving forward, making it easier for the motorcycle to get rolling the first few feet. So a lot, a lot of people, you know, just sit up straight, let's clutch out and go. Um, and some are laying down on the tank and and take off already down on the tank. It's all, there's like three or four different riding styles I see out there. Yeah. And so that came, for me, that came from George Bryce. When I went to his uh, drag racing school in 94. And that was always his big thing was, you know, if, if you're using your body weight to propel the motorcycle forward, it's gonna go quicker off the starting line. than if you were just sitting there and the bike, you know, it kind of has to run into you, you're slowing it down. So I started a long time ago doing that. And so it, it definitely helps the 60 foot. Um, and another part of that is the weight, you know, the smaller the rider, um, the more leverage you have with weight where you want to put it. Cause we all have to weigh the same amount with the rider on the motorcycle. So if, if you're small and you you can get under the minimum weight, then you have to add weight to the bike, and it's a strategy where you put the weight. Um, kind of a uh, same same idea as you know doing the ramming thing, putting the weight in a it helps it be put better also. Susan, with this man riding near 200 miles per hour in the open air, the freedom of a motorcycle with nothing but leathers and skull bucket on him i've got to ask have you got over the nerves or does every run still kind of get you choked up and you're like oh here we go no i'm never nervous he uh and i don't think i really i've been one time um in dallas in 2013 14 yeah, 13. 13 um he had a tire um come off the bead at 190 miles an hour 195 and that was scary because it was it did this little Fish tail thing, what, 17, 18 times or something, but um, he didn't go down, thank gosh. But um, so then they came back and I guess they put the same tire back on the wheel. So I was like, we're not going to put a different tire on there? No, the tire's fine. We just need to move where the screws are or whatever. I'm like, so we went up for the next, and the next round, my heart was in like my throat and I was shaking and that was the only time I've ever been nervous. And it went right on down track. I had a great run. I'm like, okay, I'm good. But I don't. He's gone in the sand trap a couple of times. I think the last time he went in the sand trap a couple of years ago, I looked down there. He's in the sand track. And I looked up at the, at the scoreboard. And I'm like, is that what we went? And everybody goes, you know your husband's down in the sand <laughs> trap, right? I'm like, yeah, he'll be fine. He went fast. It's okay. He went fast. We're good. <laughs> so I, I don't. Maybe I should. But. He's, he's done it so much longer than we've been together that, and he's really good um, at it. He's, he's had a couple of really scary things happen where he saved it, like, no problem. So I don't, I don't worry about it. Uh, he's, uh, he'll, he'll be okay. It's okay. It's, he's, he's fine. fine. He's fine. Well, good. Just good. in the kitty litter. It'll be fine. It's, <laughs> it's soft on. enough. It's soft enough. He'll be fine. <laughs> Matt, uh, well, Scott, look, I know from 
what my research diving in and doing and you know to speak with you tonight you don't just race pro stock motorcycle or at least at one time you didn't just race pro stock motorcycle uh there's a class out there pro gas i'm not really that familiar with it so talk to me about some of the other classes that you have written in and what are some others that you might in the future so we used to run in the the hgra the all harley drag racing association um a buddy of ours bob bongiorno uh had a motorcycle that you know we were lucky enough to get to be a part of that and ride his motorcycle for quite a few years and we kind of traveled all over the country with that um and there was a few different you know uh parts of the motorcycle changed you know for a while it was pro stock then it was pro gas um pro gas was a power adder so we had you know a turbo on the bike that was that was quite an adventure turbo mm -hmm. on a harley oh boy. Uh, it was it was a great sanction you know and a lot of you know great people out there doing it uh, a lot of the guys that are running the nhra top field harley now you know we raced with them in hgra mm -hmm. matter of fact um they are blue guy um did a lot of hgra racing back in the mm -hmm. day a lot, a lot of great people came out of that and um we, we definitely had a lot of good times you know around bob and everything that he had going i mean it was it was a lot of fun one of one of the other things that we did is we we ran the the quickest fastest electric motorcycle on the planet for about 12 yes. years and uh bill and eva dubay are the ones that put that program together and we did a lot of tv shows like mythbusters um, you know several other things but it was really unique uh, motorcycle that that Bill was at the top of the game of the electric stuff, um, making more power, going faster. We went 780s at 174 miles an hour, you know, with a like he always called it a cordon drill, basically. Um, you know, so lot, lots of different stuff like that. Did a lot of sportsman racing in the NHRA, you know, with Kawasaki's and Suzuki's. Um, just kind of a little bit of a whole gamut of stuff. We've, we've had a lot of invites to do uh, stuff on Bonneville. Um, never been able to make the schedule work out right. But one, one of these days, I'd like to be able to go do that. Um, 100 mile up there. Um, you know, just something. New. Just haven't haven't had the chance to do it yet. He was supposed to do the Isle of Man on the electric bike. Um, oh gosh, that was a long time ago. And you weren't you on your way or something? Something happened, and they couldn't ship the batteries. They couldn't ship the batteries. The air didn't. They, it was supposed to go on an airplane or something. They said we're we're not taking those batteries. It would have to be boated or shipped, and it would take too long. So we didn't get to do that. We went to Iceland once to run it, and same thing happened. Um, we went to New Zealand and ran it for. We were there for like eight days in 2010, I think. Yeah. And that was really cool. The, where we ran it, the drag strip um, was on grass, and it was right. It, it was also a landing strip. So when a, a plane had to land, you waited until the plane landed, and then you went. It was crazy, but it was fun. It, New Zealand was awesome. It was awesome. There, there was, uh, you know, a lot of people over there that that wanted to see the electric motorcycle, and the fan the fans just absolutely loved it. Um, it was neat, you know, getting the talk to you know, the New Zealanders and see yeah. what you know, life was like there. And um, we, we met a, a really good friend there that, that rides a top fuel motorcycle, um, Ethel. Ethel Williams. And um, we, we still keep in touch with him today. Matter of fact, they were emailing last night. Yeah. Um, he, he still has a top fuel motorcycle that he runs in Australia and New Zealand. They're on lockdown too. So he said he was, he was what did he say he was building? Crankshafts or something? Yeah. 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 You're working on crankshafts. <laughs> yeah, trying to stay busy. Well, honestly, I'm kind of glad you didn't make the Isle of Man. I mean, this will make the first year since they canceled it. There hadn't been a death in probably the whole entire <laughs> event of oh, the yeah. Isle of Man. I mean, I love the Isle of Man, but those guys are, they're a whole nother level in motorsports. It is spectacular what they do. Let me ask this, Susan. 
you've been hanging around this long enough, any desire to hop on the bike and take a run down? Have you done that? Will, will you ever do that? Well, oh, I have no desire to do that. I have, my, I have my, or had my own street bike, so I ride, but one of us racing is enough. It's enough. I just want, I just want to see him win. I just, that's all I care about. I, I guess I live vicariously through him, I guess. I just like seeing him happy. Like work, work is stressful, home life's stressful. We've raised three kids. We've got a grandbaby that we're taking care of. Mom and him live here and life is just stressful. And so when we go out there, it's just, that's why it's our hobby. It's not, I mean, it's not stressful. It's stressful for us to get there. A lot of plane rides from the West Coast, it's tough, but um, I just, it makes me happy because he's, doing what he loves and it's just he works really hard here at home so it's nice to be able to go and have see him enjoy have fun and enjoy himself because he gets up in the morning at, and he's gone every morning at 5 30 headed to work and doesn't get home till 6 6 37 sometimes 7 30 every night so he's a very hard working man so those weekends we go to do that it's just we've always said when it stops being fun we'll stop doing it or if we don't have any money or a sponsor <laughs> there is that it is neat though that you know that we get our time away you know to go do that stuff and it's it's always like an adventure you know because you're going here and going there you know seeing different stuff and and you have like a whole another family basically yeah. out there on the road that you know you spend a lot of time with them throughout the year so we're always planning things with you know other racers and the a neat neat deal that you know we get to do all that together Get on the plane and head to wherever it is we're yeah. going and you know see all of our friends out there you know plus we're racing and you know it's just, what we love. yeah it's just really neat that we get to do that and most of our best friends i mean we have a lot of best friends here too but it's hard to foster those relationships when you're only home for three months or whatever a year and then when we are home most of the time i don't even want to leave the house and now i can't leave the house and i want to leave the house <laughs> that doesn't make any sense but so everybody on the road are the people that we're the closest with. Matt and Angie were the best man and the maid of honor at our wedding. So we literally spend more time, you know, total with everybody on the road. So it's important that we all like each other so much. So it's good. We love it. It's, it'll be hard when we are done. Not just the racing, but the family. It really makes, everybody says it and it's true. It is a racing family. Like any of us could call each other, at, like Kelly Flance, call me at five o'clock in the morning, my time or whatever, if she needs something, need me to wire her money to get her out of jail. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's like, it is, it's a family and it's, it's, it's great. We love it. All right. So in talking about your background, Scotty, and mentioning some of the other different classes, the electric bike, top fuel, Harley was also mentioned. So from a fan perspective, you've got like pro stock motorcycle, and then you've got you know, top view Harley, it's, it's just insane. It's a whole nother level, the skips. Well, someone as seasoned as you and the other pro stock motorcycle riders, does it seem like that far of a jump to top fuel Harley or is it not as insane because you're not too far off from it anyway? No, I, I think it's a huge difference. Um, and I know there's, you know, quite a few of us. I know Matt wants to do it. I want to do it. I don't want um, him to do it. That would make me nervous. Any any bike you can't sit on while you start it is scary to me. I'm uh, saying. You know, Michael Ray, um, he's he's, he's been racing quite a bit of that stuff. Um, he hasn't done top fuel, but he's done, um, you know, some of the other classes that run on fuel that run in the in the sevens. Um, so I I would I would like to try it. Um, you know, I've seen I've seen a lot of things that can happen in that class. You know, it's not, it's not something I'd want to do all the time, but I'd like to try, you know, just make a couple laps and, you know, see, see what it's like and, and uh, you know, how hard it is to control. Because you watch those guys and, and it looks like the motorcycle's riding them a lot more than they're riding the motorcycle mm -hmm. a lot of times. So I just, I think it'd be a neat, you know, challenge, you know, something different, something to try, and, you know, see if you could do it. I, I think it'd be neater if you got a, a top fuel funny car. I would like that. I would fully back that if you wanted to drive a top fuel funny car. Not a top fuel Harley. I'd, I'd be into that for sure. <laughs>
Awesome. Well, Susan endorses the Top Fueler over the Top Fuel Harley. I don't blame you. Anything you got to wear a flat jacket for while you're running it. <laughs> wow. Thank you, right? Exactly. Bulletproof vest? Nope. So were you two at the Darlington test? And if you were, how did it go? Give us some updates and uh, what you're looking forward to in the 2020 season once we get there. So we were in Gainesville, obviously, when they shut it down and sent everybody home. And we hadn't got to test yet. So our first you know, inclination was, hey, can we stay here and test? And they said no. So all the Orlando said, can we come down there and test? And they said, sure. Then we got word that the governor was wanting to lock Florida down, not let anybody in or out. So then we panicked. We're like, well, we got to get out of here. So we called Darlington. They said, sure, come up here and test. So we drove up to Darlington. Uh, you know, Matt and Angie uh, were, were going to test. And Bellis came and rode one of the other bikes. And uh, I don't, there was one other motorcycle, I think, that ran when we were there. Oh, uh, Mark. Yeah, Ingerson. Ingerson. No, that's Inger, not how Ingerson. you say it. But, um, so, yeah, we got lucky, you know, had a spot where we were able to go test, made uh, three runs on the motorcycle. Was was really, really good to get back on the motorcycle, you know, because I hadn't rode since Pomona. Um, the bike was flawless. You know, yeah. Awesome. Made three really, really good runs. Um, really happy with, you know, the way the thing went. You know, a lot of times you'll come in, uh, first pass of the year, you know, when you haven't rode in three or four months and it's a little iffy, you know, on how good a job you do or, you know, whether everything's right with the motorcycle, but every, everything went about as good as you could expect it to go for the first runs of the year. So, so now we're even more antsy and excited, you know, to get to the next race, which we still got a couple of months, but, um, but at least we have that now that, um, you know, we know the motorcycle where it should yeah. be. And, and uh, I did okay. Yeah, it'll. You did good. It'll it'll be good. And it's purple. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looked really good. Going it looked really good in the sun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad the test went well. Now, when I talk to pro stock motorcycle riders, and I've got a little bit more time, like I do, I love to ask this question because I'm amazed at one how long leathers can in fact last, but. Even the flip side of that, how long a figure can actually last to fit into those leathers. So, Scott, look, do you have a workout regimen, or are you just one of those persons that naturally, you know, keeps his figure? And, well, you've got a former bodybuilder. I'm sure you got any all the help you need to stay in shape. Well, I periodically have a different workout routine, which mostly my workout routine is running. Um, but the last – year or so I've been kind of slacking on that for about five or six years I did it quite a bit um, but I've always been really lucky as far as you know my weight I've not had to you know diet too much or any of that kind of stuff the one the one thing I have is right here next to me I have the best cook in the world and we're both we're both foodies and love food so you know she cooks dinner every night um, phenomenal stuff all the time so sometimes I have to watch that a little bit about eating more than I need to but for the for the most part I stay, stay pretty thin and pretty consistent I've got a whole bunch of sets of leathers dating back quite a few years and I think I can I can fit in any of my him. things still so. yeah he doesn't change much although we're probably gonna have to take some weight off the motorcycle in June because I've heard there's a quarantine 15 that we're all going to gain. And I think <laughs> I've cooked a lot and I'm coming up with new recipes every day. And it's, it's been really fun, <laughs> but yeah, we're going to have to hit, going to have to start the diet again, probably the first of May if we're going to be ready in June. Yeah. Well, sadly, I've probably already hit my quarantine 15 <laughs> and I will definitely be more of a funny car driver than ever being in the leathers <laughs> on a pro stock motorcycle. Maybe you should do Top Fuel. <laughs> hey, top, top Fuel Harley, they got some big boys. You can fit right in. <laughs> there we go. I got, I got the beard. You I got, got the I, beard. I, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. Yeah. So, with, uh, with your 2019, it wasn't too bad. You had two semifinal round appearances, and you had a career best speed, I believe it was, at the Carolina Nationals. 
I'm sure you want to top that for 2020. So tell me, what are the goals for 2020? And from what I understand, you're still looking for that first Wally. What would that mean for you? You know, so we've been out here a long time in, in the post-op motorcycle deal and almost kind of like a running joke now, you know, that, that we've never won. And we've, we've actually been in a lot of finals. Um, we haven't quite got over the hill in one of, one of them yet, but that, that's always, you know, the big goal for the year, you know, is to win a race. And obviously it's not something to take lightly. It's, you know, definitely really, really difficult. There's, you know, competition out there is crazy. So many good riders, you know, so many good vehicles. Um, you really have to have everything come together, you know, on that Sunday to get that done. You gotta have a lot of luck too. And we don't yes. seem to have a lot of good luck sometimes or the, in the final, especially. We'll have like a 25 cent bolt break and so we lose, but it's all right. But we'll get it eventually. I'm not gonna quit till we get it. It's always out there, you know, so we're, we're always working towards that and, and we'll get there when it's our turn, you know. Yeah. You're, you're, you're not guaranteed anything out here. You got to earn it. And, you know, it'll happen. I don't know when, but it'll happen. Well, you're definitely associated with a great team in Matt Smith Racing, and you've got a great, great partner like strutmasters.com. Tell me, what is the dynamic like? What's the deal? What's the setup with you and Matt Smith Racing? It, are you, you know, renting the bike? Are you a hired gun? You know, what's, what's the scenario there under that umbrella? We're, we're kind of like an independent contractor. So we, we rent the equipment from Matt and we rent his brilliant mind for the tuning end of it. So, so Matt takes care of everything. You know, he uh, is in charge of all the maintenance on the motorcycle. He does all the tuning. Um, he has, you know, parts galore. You know, he's probably the most well-equipped team out there, mm -hmm. you know, with, you know, runs four bikes a lot of times. Nobody else does that. Um, he's a brilliant tuner. He, he tunes all four of them. Um, and he, you know, like I say, he's, he makes a lot of power. He's got a lot of parts. Um, he never, he never quits. I mean, he's always working on something, you know, something new coming, some new part, working on the dyno. Um, you know, we've, we've been with Matt for a long time and, and he's really, really good at what he does. Him and Angie both, um, you know, they, they put a great program together. They work nonstop too, like both of them. She works just as hard as he does. Got great people working with him. You know, Michael Ray is a really He's good phenomenal. friend of ours. Mm -hmm. You know, worked on our motorcycle all year last year. Um, Nate works on Matt's bike. He does a great job. You know, so it's like every motorcycle has a rider. Um, Matt tunes them all, and then they all have you know a crew guy that does all the maintenance on them. Um, so for having a lot of motorcycles there, it goes really smooth and. You know, Matt's, Matt's done a great job putting all that together. It's, and it's not like just we're just renting. We, it, they make us feel like part of the team because we are. We are a team. And, and it's, it, it's the best scenario for us because, he, like you know, he's got a full-time business. And us being able to fly in and do what we got to do, sometimes help set up if we get there in time, help tear down if we can, and then fly home. And then they take him home, refresh him, do everything. It's the, it's the perfect balance for us, and we all fit really good together. Our team is it's awesome. We, I couldn't ask for a better setup as far as personalities go. We love Michael, our crew guy. Matt and Angie are amazing. Matt's brilliant with his tuning. If, you know, and he, he'll kill himself to figure something out, and we never have to doubt that. We're really blessed with that, and, and I probably don't give him enough kudos. But... <laughs> Is he going to watch this? <laughs> oh, yeah, I love you, Matt. Um, so we're really happy. It's it's awesome. We just can't get wait to get back at it. I told you I'm going crazy in here. It, it's nice to know that we don't have to worry about, you know, the motorcycle, you know, when and where it's going to be there. You know, all, all we have to worry about is getting ourselves there and, and uh, you know, riding and doing a good job. We know that you can take care of everything else. Yeah. Make, makes it really good. Know, knowing all that because he can pull it off with four motorcycles you would think it would be complete and utter chaos and it isn't it's 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 really a fine oil machine 
and it, it works like seamlessly. I've seen other people that can't even pull off one or two as gracefully as he can pull off four. So we're really lucky to be where we're at. That's good news that the partnership is that fluid and there isn't that imaginary wall because you've got a different scenario. You're, you know, you're just outside the team, even though you're under the umbrella. So that's awesome to hear that you're that included, that you're incorporated to the team truly with the setup that you've got and that it works so well for you two. Well, Scott, Susan, look, thank you for your time. I've enjoyed my time with you for dragracing.tv. Look, last word from YouTube. Give me a word for your fans, partners, and your competitors. So I think, you know, first of all, I really, really hope that, you know, a lot of fans, you know, get to come out this year and experience, you know, the whole NHRA thing, what we got going on. Uh, you know, like it always has been, you know, because the fans have been great. Um, I want to thank Chip Lofton, strutmasters.com. You know, we obviously couldn't be doing this without him. Um, it's it's huge, you know, that that he has the passion that he does to want to help so many different teams. You know, like you say, he's got, you know, 14 you know, teams out here. Um, so many people, you know, benefit from him having that passion and coming out here and doing that. And, uh, hopefully we haven't really talked to him too much since he got out of surgery, but I hope he's uh, doing good and running a marathon soon. I got a thumbs up. So yes, I do um, know he's doing okay. He got out. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, just really excited to get back to it as soon as we can, you know, see all of our racing family, um, you know, everybody out there just really looking forward to it. We, and we love our fans. We have some of the greatest fans. Our entire class have some of the greatest fans. I, um, I really hope and pray that this whole virus thing doesn't hurt it as bad as I'm afraid it might, because the fans are so great. And without the fans, we're, I mean, what's even the point that we do? What we do, we do for the fan. I mean, we want to be out there and race and win a race, obviously. Um, but the fans, we do, like, that's my passion. That's why I want to make sure the autograph sessions go off without a hitch and everybody's happy and, you know, everybody gets a chance to see their favorite driver and, and writer and, you know, get the autograph that they want or whatever. And it's just, it's so awesome, you know, because we started as fans. We came to the national events, you know, myself, him way before me, obviously, but myself 16 years ago, the first person I met was Karen Stouffer. And she's so amazing and she still is and she's awesome. It's like everybody that you see in our pits are so real and down to earth and um, are, it's just awesome. So coming from the fan side, I know what it's like to be on this side of the ropes and now being on that side of the ropes, I try to make sure that the fans are happy, you know, because I think a lot of times some, some of the higher you get in any sort of sport, you forget that the reason you're here is because of the fans. Fans don't come, they, this won't exist. So I'm excited to get back out there and I'm really hoping we can put together something that will work so that the fans can still get the experience that they deserve, quite frankly. So we'll see, I hope so. Give me that word to your competitors. Definitely wanna hear on that. Oh, we love you, man. <laughs> make sure you come, if you can make it, uh, even if the race is at a different time, Come, we'll take care of you. We'll find a way. We'll find a way to do it. I'll make sure we have uh, antibacterial, whatever, <laughs> hand sanitizer, mask, whatever you need. Just come and see us. I'm, I'm hoping that, that all the racers, you know, are able to make it back out, too, yeah. because, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty on, you know, and different things with the economy and different things with jobs. And, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, everybody wants, that wants to race is still going to be able to yeah. race. There's that, it, too. It's going to be tough, you know. I, I'd hate to see, you know, the fields. Fill. Yeah. You know, want to have, want to have full fields. For sure. Drag racing fan. That's been Scotty and Susan Palachek here on drag racing TV. All of it brought to you by strutmasters.com. The suspension experts. I'm the Monday morning racer Lee Craft. It's been great to be with you. And until next time, God bless and keep the pedal to the metal. <laughs>